Okay. Well, today we're going to be in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. We're going to finish out the prologue, and that's exciting because that means we're going to start getting into the narrative portions of the book of John. But before we get into any of it, I'm going to open in prayer, and then we'll dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, you are sovereign. You are a holy God and a sovereign God. You are king of all things. You created all things, and there's nothing that happens outside of your knowledge and control. You don't move us around like puppets, but everything that happens has been ordained by you. It's been allowed by you. It happens with your blessing. There are things that we do that make you sad, that make you angry, because you are all the time angry at sin. And yet you allow these things to happen, and you work in those things to glorify yourself. And we praise you for that, because you deserve the glory. Lord, you've ordained that we should come together today to spend time in the Gospel of John, learning about who Christ is. That's the ultimate goal here. That's why John wrote the Gospel. That's why you spoke through the words of all the writers of the books of the Bible to point people to Christ. And so I pray that you would point us to him today, that you would open our eyes to help us to understand spiritual truths, to understand foundational doctrines, so that your word can do the thing that you've purposed for it to do, that it would save and that it would sanctify. And I pray these things in his name, the Lord and Savior that we're going to study today. Amen. All right, so we've been going through the book of John, and uh, let's see. Uh, we're still in John chapter 1, and I'd like for us to read the whole prologue again. We've been doing this each time, and I'd like for us to do it again. So, <clears throat> Bamsey, if you'll read, there's 18 verses. If you'll read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and then I'll read the second half, 10 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me, ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who was at the Father's side. He has made him known. So last week we, we focused on verses 12 and 13. And I want us to just review that for just a second before we we turn over into the next paragraph and get into verse 14. Um, in verse 12, it says, but all who did receive him. We've been talking about how the entire world rejected Christ, but it says to, put, to all those who did receive him, the world generally rejects Christ. Even his own people, the Jews, rejected Christ when he came, but individuals received him. And what does it mean to receive him? What did we say was the means by which we receive him. Um, it's described right there in verse 
12. To all who did receive him, who did what? Who believed in him, in his name. That's right. Who believed in his name. And this is, this is critical here. We, understanding this word to believe, understanding um, what the word faith means. We're going to use this word a lot as we study scripture, the word faith. Believing here is not just intellectual acknowledgement of some facts. I can believe that an airplane flies because I see it up there, but actually getting on the plane and trusting it with my own life, that's a different level of belief. And that's sort of um, a picture of what saving faith looks like. When we talk about belief in his name, we're talking about a trusting in him to do something that we can't do. And that thing is to save. What Christ came and did on this earth was to accomplish one thing, and that was the salvation of the children of God. If we try to accomplish that, if we try to reconcile ourselves to God in our sinful nature, we can't do that under our own power. And we'll get into that a little bit um, later on when we talk about it. it says the law was given through Moses. That's sort of to prove to us that we can't do that on our own. And so when we believe in his name, when we, when we trust on him, is where we use the word trust, or to lean on him, it's to say, I can't do it on my own. I can't reconcile myself to God, but Christ did that on my behalf. And so I'm going to trust fully in what he did and in his promises for my salvation. And that's what we call saving faith. And so what's the end result there um, at the end of verse 12? What happens when we receive Christ by believing in his name? What does he give us at there at the end of verse 12? The end of? The end of verse um, 12. Oh. There's another comma and it says he, he gave, gave the right to become the children of God. He gave the right to become children of God. And this phrase is, is wonderful. Because in, in, while most of the world believes that all created humans are children of God, the Bible paints a very different picture. We studied last week in the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> where it says that when we're born, we're followers of Satan. He's the adversary, the father of lies. He's the, the, um, the, the, the image that we follow after because we reject God. If we're rejecting God, then what we're actually following is the example of Satan. It calls us children of wrath because from conception, as sinners, we are under God's wrath. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we are under God's wrath, we need something that we don't have. We need to be reconciled to him because if we, if we die in that sin, if we um, persist in that state of unbelief, the end result is that we will spend eternally in hell, which is a real place. It's a place where God punishes sin, where he punishes those who have rejected him. And so when we talk about being saved, when we talk about salvation, ultimately we say this word in the context of being saved from the wrath of God. Um, when Jesus came to die on the cross, the payment that he made was not to Satan. The ransom that he paid is not to Satan. The ransom he paid is to God because um, God's justice, God's holiness, his righteousness demands that he punish sin, that, that he, he can't let an offense go by and just wave it away and say, that's not a big deal. That would make him unjust. And an unjust God is not portrayed here in the Bible. He is a very just God. And so something had to happen. And we're going to get into that in starting in verse 14, what he did about that. But the Bible doesn't call us children of God from birth. That This is something that we become. It says that we are adopted into the family, that we become adopted children of God. So to all who receive him by believing in his name, trusting in the work, the, the person and work of Jesus Christ for our salvation, he gives the right to become children of God. And then we talked a little bit in verse 13 about the new birth. And it, it, 13 starts off by talking about what the new birth is not. 
So what are the things that new birth is not in verse 13? Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Good. So not of blood, not of the will of the flesh. Not of the will of man. And not of the will of man. Put a born, uh, oops, born not, put a big not. Okay, so not of blood, in, uh, in the Greek it's actually plural, bloods. This is a reference to natural descent. This means that if somebody that you, uh, that, that's one of your ancestors was saved, that they're a believer that they've been born again, being born of them does not make you born again. You can have a grandfather that was a preacher and a, gr a very great warrior for Christ. That doesn't matter. You cannot be born again by born, being born into a Christian family. Okay. Now, this also means that because you don't have to be born into, you're, you're not born again because you're born into a Christian family, it means that other people who are not of the faith, other families that are not of the faith, their children can become children of God. Okay, so this is, this is an important thing. The will of the flesh is a reference to our self. So I can't be born again by just deciding to be born again. A minute ago, we talked about needing to trust in the work of Christ to accomplish our salvation, not our own. So this isn't something that we can do ourselves. The will of man is, is a reference to others. So somebody else can't do something for me that will cause me to be born again. They can't perform some rite over me. They can't baptize me into it. Um, I, there, there are some uh, religions and cults that believe that you can perform rites and activities um, to confer grace on somebody who's already passed away. And the Bible says that's, that's not a thing. You can't do that. It's not, you can't be born again by the will of man. But what can you be born again by? What are we born again by? At the end of verse 13. But of God. The will of God. But of God. Very good. So there's three things that we can take away from that. One is that the new birth is supernatural. It is only accomplished by God. The new birth is also spiritual. It's not like... Our first birth, our first birth is physical. That's how this happened, okay? The new birth is something that happens on a spiritual level. It has something that happens to your soul. Sometimes we say that it happens to your heart. You were, you were dead in sin and trespasses with a heart of stone. God gives you a heart of flesh. He gives you a, a heart that is alive. And the third thing is that it is a sovereign birth because it is not up to our will and it's not up to somebody else's will and it's only up to God's will, that means he as king, it's up to his will, who is born into the kingdom of God. So that's where we ended up last week. And that's, I wanted to review that real quick before we get into verse 14. And in verse 14, we are going to get into a very, one of the most succinct descriptions of what the gospel actually is. There are a lot of people who run around and use the word gospel but there is one true meaning of the gospel that the Bible describes, and that is what we're going to get a summary of in verse 14. So in verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now this is the first time that we've seen this word, word, big W word. In the Greek, it looks like this. Uh, Come on, if I can remember. Okay, so in English, we'd write this like this. That's the logos. And this is a pointer all the way back to verse 1. We haven't seen that word since verse 1. And here he's reminding us that the person we're talking about is not just the light. He's not just the life. He is the eternal logos. He existed before all things, and through him all things were created. So we're talking about a spiritual being. And we're talking about a deity. We're talking about God. And then something happens. It uses the word became. And he doesn't say, and the word was flesh, like he does in verse 1 where he says the word was God. He said the word became flesh. Became meaning before that 
He was not. He was only spirit. Now, now he's become flesh. And this is talking about the incarnation of Christ. This is a, the big word that we use for that, the incarnation of Christ. That before he was spirit, now he became flesh. Now, there's some things that I want us to, to, to point out here. Because there, uh, there's multiple ways that we can understand this incorrectly. And these have been um, discussed at length by Christians throughout history since, since Jesus came. One of the ways that we can get confused here is to think that when we say he became flesh, that he didn't really have a real body. This is what we call the Gnostic error. The Gnostics believed that all flesh was sinful. This is correct. But what they believed as a result of that in reference to Christ and his incarnation was that Christ didn't really have a real body, that he was sort of a projection into human form. Sometimes we'll see the word um, avatar used. And if you're a coder, then you might know sort of a concept of an avatar is this little picture of your face and people see that and it represents you, but it's not really you. And the Gnostic era was that when Jesus became flesh, he didn't really have a real body. Instead, he was sort of like a projection into this world so that we could see him physically. But that's not the case. He had a real body that could be hurt and died, that was born and grew, um, that, he, that he ate real food. The Bible says that the disciples touched the wounds in his hands to feel the nail holes and believe because of that. Um, and so this was a very real body. Now, so I'm going to put a big line through this. He wasn't an avatar. He wasn't just um, a projection of a spiritual entity into the physical world. He also was not only man. So another way that we can get this wrong is to think, well, he was deity, and then he left all of that and became just a man. And the Bible says that that's, that's not what happened. He was fully man and fully God at the same time. Now, this is hard for us to sort of wrap our minds around because we're only man, okay? We, we've never been anything but. But for Christ to take on flesh, when he became flesh, he took on all attributes of man except for one thing. That one thing was sin. So he's not only man, he's fully man except for sin. And the reason for that is that all of us have been born of ultimately of one father, and that's Adam. We can read that account of creation in Genesis chapter 3. If you want to read up on that some more um, for next time, and, and I'll include that in Slack too, so that we get, we get a list of things to read. Adam and Eve committed the first sins. When we talk about original sin, that's not what we're talking about. When we talk about first sin, that is what Adam and Eve did. The result of the first sins was what we call the fall. The fall was a corruption. It was a punishment. It was a, a degradation of the created order of things. That, that our bodies, as a result, were cursed. Our minds became futile in their thinking. Our hearts were darkened as a result. And so that means that from conception, we are all sinners. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase that we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're born into this fallen nature. And there's only one person who's ever lived who was not born, two people that were not born in that fallen nature. One was Adam because he was created in, in a state that was not fallen. But the second was Christ. Christ was born of uh, a Mary, who was a virgin, and his father was God the Father. So he didn't have an earthly father, and as a result, he did not inherit that earth, that, that fallen nature. The other reason we know that that's true is that we talked a little bit uh, a couple of weeks ago about how God is immutable. And I'm, my scribble scrabble is getting pretty bad here. Immutable. And what does immutable mean? Do you remember? Unchangeable. Unchanging. So if God is unchanging, and then we know that God is also without sin, if he was to take on flesh and that sinful nature sort of assimilated into him and he became sinful, that means that, that he changed. Okay, so 
So he can't take on that. Instead, it went the other way around. His divine nature, his holiness, pervaded the form of flesh that he took on. So he's the only man that's ever lived that never sinned. And that's important. And we get into that uh, further on in verse 14. But before we get to that part, I want us to talk about this word dwelt. So, Vamsi, can you reread for me verse 14? The first, uh, the first part up to the, up to the comma. Okay. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Very good. So this word dwelt means literally to pitch a tent. In Hebrew, we would call this to tabernacle. And so it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like he came to be here in the midst of us. He dwelt among us in a way that was personal. He was right here with us. And this word tabernacle is a really great picture because it points back to one of the forms and figures of Christ in the Old Testament. The tabernacle was the first version of the Jewish temple. So a little bit of history here. Uh, the Jews um, went into Israel as a result of a famine. They grew as a people into a nation of millions of Jews while they were in Egypt, and the Egyptians enslaved them for fear that they would side with an enemy nation and try to take over Egypt. Well, they suffered greatly in that enslavement, and God rose up a man named Moses to rescue them, to lead them out of Egypt. By God's mighty hand, he performed many miracles, set plagues on Egypt, and the Egyptians said, please leave. And so they sent them away, and they crossed over the Red Sea, went into the wilderness for 40 years. And while they were over there, Moses went up on a mountain called Mount Sinai, and that's where God gave him the Ten Commandments. You've probably heard of the Ten Commandments before. He wrote them on stone tablets, and uh, we could spend days and weeks studying just the Ten Commandments, okay? But he also gave him many other laws. Some of those laws were uh, directions on how to properly worship God, that there was to be an order in which we worshiped God, that there was a, a proper way to do it um, that was according to how he said we should do it. One of those things was the tabernacle. This was a place of worship. And Remember, they, they, they lived in the wilderness at this point. They didn't have permanent cities that they could live in. They traveled and lived in tents. And so the tabernacle was also a tent. And it looked kind of like this. It had some tent poles all the way around, and it was sort of a rectangular shape. Whoop, that looks bad. Let's get this one like this. This is the outer court. And there were, there were some, you know, some, some doors on different sides. Then there was an inner court. And in the very center of the inner court, there was a little bitty chamber, and this was the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies was placed the Ark of the Covenant. It was a special box that was decorated with angels on top. And inside of it, they put the stone tablets that the Ten Commandments were put in. Next to it was um, a jar that held some of the manna that they had eaten in the wilderness. Um, inside the box also was the staff that Aaron, the brother of Moses, had that budded. It was one of the miracles of God. It was a reference to his, his sovereignty and authority. And this was all in the Holy of Holies. And the high priest could only go into that one time a year. But when they built the tabernacle the first time, according to the instructions that God gave, and you can read these instructions in Exodus verses 25 through 27. This is the, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. So just flip all the way to the front, and you'll find those two. When they built it according to those instructions, God came down, and his presence rested on the tabernacle. They knew that the tabernacle was a place where they could point to and say, God is with us there. This idea of God being with us pervades all of scripture and ultimately points to Christ. And that's why John uses this word tabernacle. Let's flip to the book of Matthew. We've got four gospels at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew's the first one. I want us to flip to Matthew chapter one. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 18. Now, this is an account of the birth of Christ. This is his human birth. This is something that John um, describes in the language we're using now, that he became flesh and dwelt among us. We get more of a narrative historical account from Matthew writing to the Jews here. And he, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, this is something that happens to Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Are you, I'm sorry, I didn't wait to see if you were there. Are you in Matthew chapter 1? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So in other words, she's become pregnant. She claims to be a child with the Holy Spirit. He has no proof of this. Nobody, nobody's come to him and told him about it. So he's going to follow the law and divorce her, but he doesn't want her to get into big trouble. He's just going to do it quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so ultimately, this picture of God with us points to Christ. And they even gave him that name, Emmanuel, God with us. So when he says he came and dwelt among us, this is not just a transcendent God, a God that's above all things so far that we could never reach him or even see or speak to him. He's not a God who created all things, spun the earth into existence, threw it out into the universe and said, let's just see what happens. He is what we call an imminent God. He is right here with us in our presence, working actively in history to redeem a people for his own. So this is, this is, a, this is a wonderful picture of the gospel as a whole. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us to accomplish our salvation. So when you get some time, read, read up in Genesis, or Read Genesis and Exodus there, those two references. I'll include those in Slack. And you'll get a picture of the tabernacle and all of the detail that went into that, that was prescribed. Okay, so let's continue with 14. It says, we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He uses this word glory. And... The, the, one of the, the sort of a momentary glimpse of the glory that Jesus had before the world was created appeared at what we call the transfiguration. This is an incident where Jesus pulled his three closest disciples aside, Peter, James, and John. He took them up on a mountain, and it says that he was transfigured before them, that he was in his earthly body but he was glorified in a way that they could see it as though they were seeing the glory that he had before time began. And God the Father spoke out of heaven and spoke about his love for the Son. And the three disciples sat there and got to watch. And Moses was there and Elijah was there and they were all conversing together. And this is sort of an instance where John got to see his glory in person because John was party to this, John the evangelist. But he saw his glory in more than just the transfiguration. He saw his glory in the way that Jesus acted and spoke throughout his life, that God really was um, working through him and that he was God. He was the, the, the image of God, that he was uh, one with the Father. Here it says that he was full of grace and truth. And ultimately, these, these attributes, grace and truth, we'll talk some more about that in a minute, are what Christ is. He, he didn't, he wasn't filled with this and then sent to us. 
Grace and truth are what he is. God is truth, and he is gracious. I think I mentioned this in our very first lesson. Do you remember what John's name actually means? That what the name John means? I think I remember, but I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. All right, it means God is gracious. God is gracious. That the name John is God is gracious. And here he is talking about how God is gracious to us, that he sent his only son to accomplish our salvation. That's the means by which he shows his grace. So let's get into verse 15. Now, we see the, the, the name John. Read for, reread for me verse 15, if you will. Uh, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Very good. So this is sort of a parenthetical statement. He says, the word became flesh. Who is this? This is the one that John bore witness about. Now, whenever we see John's name written in the gospel of John, who's it talking about? Is it John the evangelist or John the Baptist? Evangelist. Okay, John the Evangelist wrote the Gospel of John, and every time he refers to himself, he doesn't use his name. He says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Oh. He never refers to himself by his name. Whenever we see the name John, it's in reference to John the Baptist. Okay. Okay. And so here, and this is important for us to know, because who's making this claim? It's John the Baptist. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. John, something we need to know about John the Baptist is he had a very popular ministry. If we were to think of him in today's terms, we would think of him like a Billy Graham. Lots of people coming to hear Billy Graham speak. If we were thinking about him in terms of like the, um, the uh, I forget what it was called, the, the, there was a big revival period in American history, and there were preachers like Jonathan Edwards, where people came in droves to hear him speak, and many were saved as a result. John the Baptist is one of those people. He was raised up for the very purpose of pointing people to Christ, and his job was to call the people to repent and turn back to God. This was a period in history where the Jews had strayed very far from God, that their religion was only outward in form, that there was no inner truth to their faith in God. And he was calling people to turn back, to repent. And people came to him in droves. He was a weird guy. He wore camel hair for, for clothes. He ate locusts and wild honey out in the wilderness. I guarantee you he probably stunk a little bit, okay, as a result. But people came to hear him preach and teach and were baptized by him. And so in, in worldly terms, we could say that John the Baptist had a very successful ministry. If we were just looking at numbers, we would go, wow, he's really popular. That's a successful ministry. And yet John makes a claim about Christ that throws that out the window. He said, he ranks before me. He comes after me, but he ranks before me because he was before me. Now, which one of them was born first? If we're talking about before, maybe he meant John the Baptist. Maybe he was born first, but he wasn't. John the Baptist was born first, like six months earlier. So how can he say he was before me? Well, what do we remember about the Logos, the word? What did we say the Logos was earlier? We said that Jesus, the Logos, was eternal. And so here he's right in saying that he was before me. He, he was so far before me, he was before creation. That, that he, ranks, he, is, he ranks before me because he is God. And so we see here, uh, he, John just sort of throws this successful bit out, and we get to see his humility in his role with Christ, his relationship to, to Christ who has come, 
We're in John chapter one. I just want you to turn one page over to John chapter three. In John chapter three, we get to see an even better picture of John's the Baptist humility. I'll start reading in verse 22. Are you, are you there in John chapter three? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Verse 22, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and remained there with them and was baptizing. John, this is John the Baptist, also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now, this is where it gets good. In verse 25, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. Now, to who, whom did he wear, bear witness to? Christ. Christ, very good. To whom you bore witness. Look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. See, they're worried. They've been following John. He's the popular guy. But it looks like he's, his popularity is declining. People are going to this other guy named Jesus, and they're worried about it. In verse 27, John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, and I must decrease. He understands that his role was preparatory in nature, that his job was to come before the Lord and straighten the paths by calling the people to repent and turn back to God so that their hearts would be ready when Christ came, that when Jesus showed up, they would leave John the Baptist and go to Jesus. Ultimately, John the Baptist's role is evangelistic in nature. When we talk about the evangel, this is the Greek word for gospel. It means that his job was to tell other people about Jesus, not just to be a great preacher, not just to have a successful ministry in and of his own right, but ultimately everything that he did was to point people to Christ, and when Christ came, to step back. That was his job, because his job was done. So a picture of this, he must increase and I must decrease. I heard a, a, a preacher tell a story once about a missionary who went to live with a, a native tribe in a remote place. He wanted to go there and learn their native language so that he could translate the whole Bible into their language so that they would have the words of God that they could read every single day. And he got stuck on this verse. He must increase and I must decrease because in their language, they didn't have words for that. They didn't have words for increasing and decreasing. It wasn't a thing. And so he got stuck on that for a long time. And one day he was sitting with the chief of the tribe who was explaining to him how his son would one day rise up, be trained, go through the rites of manhood, and take his place as leader of the people in the chief's place. And the chief used this phrase. He said, my son must set so that his son can rise. And so this picture of the sun setting and sun rising, that's what John was thinking about his ministry. Jesus's ministry is rising. It, it's, it's coming to fruition. My ministry is sunsetting. And that's the picture that I want us to get here. Ultimately, John humbly saw that although God had given him a successful ministry, that he had received that power from God to do the things that he did, um, that ultimately it was all for one purpose. And that was to point people to the only name under heaven by which we may be saved. And that's Jesus Christ. So let's turn back. We've got, once again, I've run out of time. I want us to talk a little bit about the next three verses, and then we'll finish out the prologue. And next week, we'll pick up on the narrative portions of John. John chapter 1 and verse 16, for we have, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Some translations will say grace in place of grace already given. Um, it's sort of like the cup is full and God keeps pouring in that grace, that it's not a limited amount of grace that we're given. It's not, well, I know that you've sinned. I've made a sacrifice for that. And so you're given this much grace. That, that's not how it looks. I've given, it's not that I, even that I've given you just enough to save you. No, God from his fullness gives us grace upon grace upon grace in Christ. 
that it keeps pouring out and overflowing into our life and spilling out into those around us. In verse 17, he makes some contrasts. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We see a contrast of law. Let me get my pen back out here and erase this bit. We, we, we see a contrast of several things in this verse. In verse 17, we see the law contrasted with grace, that the law was given through, that grace came through, and then we see the persons by which they came, Moses contrasted with Christ. So the law of God as given through Moses is described in the first five books of the Old Testament. We call that the Pentateuch, which just means five books, okay? And, and in the law, Moses is writing down the, the, the words that God wanted him to write down, that it was given, because ultimately this is God's law, not Moses' law. These are laws that came from God. The law had a very specific purpose. The law was sent to make us aware and understand our sinful nature. Okay, so we, we may not understand that what we've been doing is sin because our minds are futile and our hearts were darkened, but God's law reveals the sinfulness of the things that we've been doing. We may have been lying and thinking that's not really that bad of a thing, and we read God's law and go, wow, lying made the top 10. That's pretty bad, okay? You know, there's, there's, there's consequences for this. The law prescribed a civil order, it prescribed an order of worship for the Jewish people, but ultimately it points us to a moral understanding of what's right and what's wrong. What the law is unable to do is to help us do something about that. It makes us aware of our fallenness and our sinfulness, but we can't actually accomplish the requirements of the law because of our sinfulness. The solution to that is grace, the grace that comes through Jesus Christ that the requirements of the law that we were unable to accomplish as given through Moses, Jesus came and accomplished all of them on our behalf. He fulfilled every aspect of the law in ways that we could not because he was sinless. And so we call this his, his uh, obedience to the law fully. We call this his active obedience because he was actively doing this and performing righteous acts on our behalf. Uh, grace also comes in the form of what we call Jesus's passive obedience. If we break the law, there's punishment for that. The, the wages of sin is death. That death came into the world as a result of sin. It is a direct punishment on sin. And so if the wages of sin is death, it's not just physical death, it's spiritual death. We, we, we call that being separated from God for eternity, being placed in hell and punished in hell for eternity. His passive obedience is what he did on the cross. In other words, he died in our place. He, he lived and, and, and obeyed the law in our place. And when he died, he died in our place. All of the sins that, that all those who believe in his name will have ever committed were placed on him and punished in his body on the cross. These two together are the means by which Jesus accomplished this grace, that that came through Christ. We also talked about grace being just a part of who Christ is. God's law was given through Moses, was external to Moses. He was merely the, the means by which they came through. Grace is a part of who Christ is. God is gracious. And when he came, he brought that with him and accomplished it at the cross. Does that make sense? Awesome. So in verse 18, we'll finish up real quick. In verse 18, it says that no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him know. Now, who is this, the, the only God who's at the Father's side? Who is that in reference to? Um. That's Christ. That's Christ. Very good. So pro tip, there, there are these things we like to call Sunday school answers. Sometimes if you, go to, if you go to church and they ask a question 
a lot of times there's like four words that are the right answer. It's either like Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, the Bible, pray, and yes. Okay. These are Sunday school answers. So you can, you can always just guess one of those. This is one of those times where that's totally right. The, the, the only God who is at the Father's side, that's Jesus. And so that, that's a reference back to verse one, where it says that the word was God and the word was with God, that he was with God in the beginning. It says he has made him known, made him known. This word here in the Greek is where we get our word exegesis. Wow, that's a big theology word. Exegesis is, is really just a word that says we're going to take what's in scripture and we're going to draw out of the text the meaning of the text. This is in opposition to the word eisegesis, which I'm not sure I'm going to spell right because we don't actually do this. We're going to do exegesis. Eisegesis is to take my own personal understandings, wants, desires about what I want to be true, and then imputing that into the text. That's not what we're doing. When we study the word, when we study together, we're always going to read the Bible and we're going to draw the meaning out of Scripture. And when we have a hard time understanding certain passages of Scripture, we're going to go look at other passages of Scripture to help us understand that passage of Scripture. It's all going to come here from the text. When it says that Jesus made him known, there is only one man who has ever known God and been in his presence and one with him, understands him fully, and can make him known, and that's Christ. So Christ comes, get this, he brings grace. He, he actively obeys the law. He dies a substitutionary death on the cross on our behalf for this purpose, and that is to bring all those who would believe in his name into a right relationship with God the Father so that they can know the Father. And so God sends the Son to accomplish salvation from the wrath of God, and the Son gathers up his people and saves them and points them back to the Father. That this is, this is something that they do together. This is not God's angry at sin, God the Father's angry at sin, and Jesus is over here going, hey, Dad, no, it's cool. These guys are with me. And so Jesus and the Father aren't like at odds with each other. This is all one thing happening together. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all in participation together in the redemptive purpose, in saving a people, in, in saving sinners from the wrath of God. So this, this concludes the prologue of John. This is John's like 18-verse summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who he is, who, who he was before eternity, um, what his purpose was in his relationship with the world, uh, who John the Baptist was as a messenger to point people to Christ. It was who Christ was when he became flesh and dwelt among us and why he did that. Um, it, it, this is all of that wrapped up into 18 verses. And as we go through the rest of the gospel of John, we're going to see it unfold in detail. Now we're going to see the actual steps that he took in his earthly ministry as we continue along the way. We're going to get into uh, larger chunks of, of things to digest because stories, th these are more like narrative portions, some historical accounts of what actually happened. We're going to digest those in bigger chunks because you got to get the whole context of the story. So it's going to feel like we're moving faster through John, but we're going to continue to be deep dive looking at things like focusing on words and where do we get this reference and what is he talking about? We're going to continue to, to study it in that depth. Sweet. That was good. I enjoyed that. Well, good. What questions do you have? So, um, so we can uh, say the word and Emmanuel are synonyms for Christ. They or... are names. They are names okay. for Christ. Okay. Good. Um, they, they, yeah, that's the best way to put it. Names for Christ. Yeah. I forgot what Emmanuel meant. Emmanuel means God with us. It does. Yeah. And that was in Matthew chapter one. If you'll go back and okay. I'll include all these references in Slack. You go back and read that again. It says that you shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in parentheses, it said, which means God with us. 
because Emmanuel is a Hebrew word. Matthew is writing in the Greek. And so he includes the Hebrew word, but his audience is reading Greek. So he says the Hebrew word and then in parentheses he puts, and this is what that means, just so we know what that means, because not all of his yeah. readers were, um, were very good at Hebrew. I didn't know uh, the early Bible was written in Greek. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somehow. Yeah. So it, okay. um, you know, this one that we're reading is in English, but none of the Bible was originally written in English. The Old Testament was all written in Hebrew and Aramaic. These are languages spoken by the Israelite people. Um, and then the New Testament was written in Greek. Okay. And so they, they came at two different times in history. So they were, the Bible was written over a period of really thousands of years, um, all different authors inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the words of God as, as the Holy Spirit carried them along. And so that it all ties together. You read it and you go, wow, this is all like, yeah, there's different writing styles and there's different, um, uh, how do I put it? There's, there's different genres of writing but it all ties together in one unifying thing because it's all the words of God spoken by the same spirit, but the languages are different. And so, you know, in the old Testament, they wrote it in Hebrew. By the time the new Testament comes around, they're living in a world that um, is a part of the Roman empire. Remember the Romans came in after the Greeks, the Greeks um, went through and conquered a large portion of the known world at the time. And they did what they called Hellenization where they went in and sort of assimilated different people groups. One of the ways they did that was by teaching them all Greek and making sure that they all spoke the same language. When the Romans came in and conquered the, the, the Greek empire, they just piggybacked on that. Um, yes, they spoke Latin, but everybody else already spoke Greek. So they just sort of left that as, as the native tongue in a lot of regions. And so that's why much of it was written in Greek. But you'll see a lot of references to Old Testament scripture in the New Testament. And frequently those are written in Hebrew. We have the benefit of reading them in our language, translated into our language. Um, but there's a little bit of back and forth there. There are a lot of Old Testament references in the New Testament come from a Greek translation in the de that day of what was in the Old Testament. So you'll see some wording differences there too. But yeah, I would love to be able to read the original Greek in Hebrew. Um, but I have not taken those classes. That would be really fun. You have to learn Greek before that, right? Um, yes, I'd have to take, because you can take, you could go to a Bible college or a seminary, and they do teach biblical Hebrew and biblical okay. Greek so that you can understand, you know, because modern Greek is not the same as the Greek that they spoke back then. And so that you right. can actually read it in the original text and gain even deeper insights that's lost in translation in the English, for example. So that's sometimes a lot of why I'll, I'll, I'll reference back to Greek words because they give us, you know, sometimes we'll see a Greek word and we'll go, hey, that sounds like the root word for something that I already understand. And that gives me a better understanding of what he was trying to say. But I don't actually know Greek. I just, I just learn like one word at a time for the lesson. Uh, it's it's like my Sanskrit yeah. <laughs> knowledge. I, I I have a vague idea of what it means. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can't like read it through, but yeah, I can like find like okay, I I kind of know what this word means, <laughs> but yeah, the actual meaning I have to figure out in English. So yeah. Well, I've got a jet because I've got to go up on board that guy. Um, okay, cool. I'll include the Bible references from this lesson in Slack. Reread them when you get a chance. We talked about finding a place where you're already going to be sitting down and you could just have the Bible sitting there and it's a great time to just open it up and, and you can do some of that reading. And if you have questions, you read it and you go, I remember Scott said something about this, but I don't remember what it was. This will be recorded, but you can always just ping me on Slack and we can chat anytime. Sure. Sounds cool. good. All right. Thanks. Well, how about I'll close this in prayer and then we'll end. Awesome. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so glad that we got to come together to study your word today. In your word is the words of life. They give life to dead souls. That's how we are when we're born. Our bodies are alive, but your Bible describes us as being dead in sin. But you give us new life in Christ. I pray that you would do that for Ramsey that as we continue to study these words,
that you would, you would apply them to his heart, that you would save him to the uttermost. I pray that you would, as we continue to read this, you would sanctify us in this word, that you would make us more holy, like you've called us to be holy because you are holy. Help us to understand these things and for it to change who we are every day with the people that we meet and the people that we love. I thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us in this way. And I praise you. Amen. All right. Well, you have a good thank one. Thank you. You too. Bye. See you. Have a nice day.